This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everyone, to this episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's episode, a power couple breaks up, but this power couple is sticking together. WWE bringing back a retro program and rumors of a three-hour SmackDown and big news that took place just the other day. This AEW star wants out. I don't think it's any big surprise. This will be a heavy news, notes, and rumors edition of the Doc and Jock Podcast. Of course, we're going to take a look at the wonderful world of AEW and WWE, helping me break it all down, sort it all out. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc, John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Speaking of podcasting power couples, my man, it's going to be a great podcast episode this week. I'm looking forward to breaking down all the things that happened this week in the world of professional wrestling. Cinema took place on SmackDown. AEW now is uh, potentially set up for the future. Man, it was a great week of professional wrestling. Feuding content creators. Uh, The doc that everybody's talking about is coming out sooner rather than later on Netflix. Man, because so much to get into. Where are we starting? Let's kick off with uh, with WWE. Um, I thought we had a really good episode of Monday Night Raw. I thought SmackDown was really good as well, but I thought Monday Night Raw was a little bit better as far as moving storylines along, as far as some of the wrestling that we got. And I think one of the storylines that they've been really hammering home, this started with Karrion Cross, then they added Odyssey Jones into the mix, and now we've got the Latino World Order working around in this story. It's the New Day. And it's the the theory that the New Day is going to split up. Xavier Woods had the, the tag team belts won. There was some outside interference from the LF, uh, was it the Latino World Order? So the LWO. Uh, there was uh, a little bit going on with Kofi Kingston. And in the end, New Day does not come away as the tag team champs. Xavier Woods extremely pissed off. Kofi Kingston trying to explain himself. Xavier Woods saying something's got to change and just being on on a nine when the scale really only goes to to an eight and a half, but we'll say it goes to a ten. He was pissed. He was pretty upset. Is New Day going to break up? Do you want to see New Day break up? Would you like to see maybe more of a heel version of New Day? How do you think this should go? Because this has been teased for a while now. This is now going on, I want to say, probably month four with this, with this theory that New Day is going to eventually split. It uh, doesn't look like Big E's going to be able to come back anytime soon. I, I could see where you kind of do an about face with the story when Big E does come back and it kind of saves the New Day, but I don't know if he's going to ever get cleared to be able to come back and wrestle. I know he's working on it, but I'm not sure that it actually gets done. Would you like to see New Day go their separate ways, or would you like to see some kind of reclamation project where they're able to save this relationship and they're able to keep the power of positivity. Yeah, it's really actually very surprising that the New Day has gone this long without really an internal struggle or feud. I do think it's time. Um, It's it's always one of those things with tag teams that eventually they're going to, you know, have that feud. And I think it's time. It's it's a moneymaker. I think it's intriguing. Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston, I think could have a nice series of matches against each other and you could tell a story. And the key, the, the thing that would be most intriguing is you have E show up. Who does he side with? What does he think? What's the involvement? Uh, does he then become a manager? Does he then take a side? So there's a lot of questions that can be played on and looked at. So, of course, I don't think I'd want to see them be heels. It's just hard because they've been faces for so long that it would be kind of difficult. They'd have to do some really creative things to become heels, but they, they would exceed at it. And so it's going that way. And all you can say is I think a lot of people are interested to see where it goes. Yeah, I think this is a a storyline where you have multiple different outs. You have multiple different options on how you want to do this. I I don't think if they were to become heels, I don't think it would be that bad. You have to remember, New Day originally were supposed to be heels. And somehow along the way, they became the biggest baby faces you've ever seen. 
So I think they could do it. I think it's going to be interesting to see what direction they actually go with this. Like, do they walk this up to the edge and do they just pull it back? Or is this something that they go full throttle and Xavier becomes the bad guy and Kofi becomes the good guy and Kofi's kind of left scratching his head? Uh, either way you go, though, I think this is going to be a really interesting storyline. And I think this was one of the bigger things that I took out of out of Monday Night Raw. I thought it was a really interesting story arc that we're kind of pushing here. And one of the other things that was really interesting, it was the big meaty man match that we had between Braun Strowman and Bronson Reed. Uh, these guys, again, this is another long term story that's kind of been being told here. Bronson trying to take out Braun and, and Braun trying to get revenge at Bronson for getting laid out on top of a car a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this match destroyed a golf cart. This match destroyed walls in the back this match destroyed a ring uh this match was was big and violent there was a person who got picked up and used as a javelin uh bronson grabbed a person out of the crowd and chucked them at braun i thought that was a really cool moment what did you think of this match like honestly as far as wrestling goes this wasn't a great match but I thought some of the bigger spots in this, and when I say big, I use that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Some of the bigger spots in this were a lot of fun to see. And I thought this was fun to see two big guys just kind of throw each other around and really break up everything. Like, just destroy the arena. Exactly. And I think this match actually set off a week-long uh, feud online between how WWE uses their big men versus how AEW has not really effectively used Wardlow. Um, and and you, you realize, oh my goodness, it's kind of true that WWE makes these big guys look like and act like behemoths. And you realize, oh man, uh, Hobbs is not being used properly. Brian Cage probably could be a bigger star based on his size. Lance so, Archer. Lance Archer. So Bill Switch. Yes. Yeah, so it just really highlighted that. Okay, WWE knows that the big man needs to be destroyers. And you, you said it exactly the way I thought. It was a wild match, uh, a little bit of a, a, a chaos and destruction. Not the best match, but look. I think that there is a spot for Braun Strowman and Bronson Reed, and I think that you can start to develop them in terms of their feuds moving forward and how they can be used and viewed. But WWE right now is doing a good job of making you feel as an audience member, as someone watching, whoa, these guys can actually destroy things and make it so that wherever they go, chaos could follow. Yeah, absolutely. It, I thought, again, I just thought it was fun. It, this wasn't one of those things where you're like, oh, it's going to get six wrestling stars because it definitely wasn't that. But it was something fun. It was something different. And like you said, it was a way to really highlight these two big guys and show the destruction that they can cause. And I thought it was a great way to utilize them. I thought it was really, really well done. Something else that was really well done was on Friday Night SmackDown. We had this meetup. It, it was teased uh, for probably about three days. Um, we had this meetup between Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. And they met at Georgia Tech. Obviously, Cody being from Atlanta and Roman going to Georgia Tech. The way that they came in, I, I thought they, they do these little subtle things in storytelling that I think are so well done. And it's Roman coming in with an escort of black Escalades. And it's Cody Rhodes coming in in just one white Mustang. And it's like you've got, you've got these large black SUVs and you've got a whole row of them. And it shows how Roman is is basically he he has the crowd right he has he has the posse he has the group that goes with him and Cody is one man all by himself and it's like the White Knight and it, it's the the the, the Black over, Overlord I, I thought it's just so well done and then them meeting in the middle of the field and kind of recounting parts of their history and and just kind of coming together and talking about what is coming up in a couple of weeks at Bad Blood. I thought it was so well done. Uh, I thought the end was probably the most poignant moment. I thought there might have been a little bit of a misstep there where you could have really have made Cody a little bit, really built him up a little bit bigger in this. Roman's trying to walk away and Cody kind of steps in front of him and Roman says, you're in my way. And Cody just kind of looks at him and he's like, in life. He ends up walking around Cody Rhodes. And I thought that was a really cool moment. And it was really, really cool because it's really kind of boiling down what these two have been feuding about since day one. It's just that Cody is always in Roman's way and Roman needs to remove Cody. And I really felt like Cody could have 
built himself up a little bit more by saying you need to get used to it. And it could have gave him a little bit more of a badass appeal. Instead, it really does feel like Cody is second fiddle to Roman coming out of this. At least that's my take on it. Overall, I thought it was incredibly well done. I thought this was the best part of of SmackDown. I thought it was so awesome. I wanted to get your take on it. And I wanted to know if you felt the same way. If it felt like leaving this 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 scene, if Cody almost felt like he was he was definitely the one B to Roman's one A. Yeah, it was spectacular. I just don't th- listen. The one thing that you want to make sure of is that you you don't want them to do this too often because I felt like just as how great that was, the Chelsea Green one was corny in my opinion. Oh, I, I thought like, the Chelsea Green one was so funny. No, it's it's funny, but it was just like it, on the heels. It's like a totally different take. I thought it was. I thought Chelsea Green's was well done. Okay, go ahead. It, I'm sorry. No, no, and, and so to me, I look at it like okay, it's poignant and it does set up the reason why Cody and Roman will reconnect at some point down the road. And it's perfect. And and you know where it would probably be is Royal Rumble. I think that that's a great thing where maybe even The Rock could then be introduced at that point to set up why Roman and uh, Rock would then, um, uh, why Roman and Rock would then have to meet up at WrestleMania. So you have reasons why you, you set the stage. And it was beautifully done. It was masterful. The music... You know, maybe just piped in a little too loud, you know, but, you know, you could debate that was that the right style of music you could have in that situation. But look, we're nitpicking the whole segment. The eight minutes is now fully available online. WWE did a great job of parsing it up in regards to the poignant moments and then just throwing the whole thing up there. It was well done, crafted cinema. And to me, as I was watching it, the notes that I took were, man, this is looking like a television show. It's enhanced. It's looking like the next level of WWE. I told my nephew we were watching it, and I said, look, this is kind of how WWE now is with the with the resources that they have. They're actually creating a television show, like a drama. Like, this is kind of where it's centered. It's different. It's new. So my reaction was it's a little bit jarring to see it that way based on the old school. Like, you and I are just used to kind of like C-level vignettes that were corny, like that are filmed in the backstage of a bingo hall. And now to see production value where that probably cost 50K to 100K just to make it, to see the the, the angle shot. To, to actually, they produced a segment that they wanted to run on television. It was just like, wow, this is next level storytelling. This is the evolution of a partnership between Backyard Wrestling and TKO and Entertainment and uh, a, a show with executive producers. It was just crazy to see. So to me, my reaction was, wow, this is special. It's just jarring to see because it's basically like going from a basement podcast to a world-class studio that's got uh, you know 50,000 screens and you can push a button and 50 people can be on a call. You're like, whoa, this is cool, but it's jarring. So it takes a little bit of time to adapt to and I can't wait to see how they use it. But I'm glad that the two people that got that kind of treatment, Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes, my God, it was special. Yeah, and you know what? I kind of want to go off something you said here because I think you make a great point, and I didn't even think about it. But as you were talking there, the episodes that we're getting now between Monday Night Raw and between Friday Night SmackDown, it is is more television show production-esque. It is no longer... The, the live event wrestling show. It, it's still that. That is still the backbone of it. But what you're getting is you're seeing a much more refined show, a much more finely crafted show. As you were talking, I think the comparison that you can get now, especially with some of these vignettes and some of the, the production level getting ratcheted up, I don't know if you were a big fan of Lucha Underground when it was on television or not, but Lucha Underground was a wrestling television show. It was a it was a, a TV show that was completely produced, but it centered around wrestling events and it centered around uh, some mystical stuff and some some other things that 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 were a little bit outlandish, a little bit of stuff like outer space. And Lucha Underground was was really well done. It was a really good show. And that was where you got Ricochet early. That was where you got uh, the Lucha Brothers early. We're going to talk about them in the news and notes segment. Um, it was where you got. Uh, a lot of different Chelsea Green was was part of Lucha Underground. Uh, it's where you got a lot of wrestlers that you have now. Brian Cage was part of it as well. But it was a a well produced show, and the vignettes that you got were were movie esque. They were cinematic, 
And that is what you're getting with WWE. WWE has now gone from this program that is is essentially just a wrestling program to now this being a a completely refined television production that is backboned by wrestling. And I think it's it's interesting. You're right. It is a little bit jarring when you're used to seeing it the way it used to be done. I mean, your backstage vignettes used to be Mean Gene Okerlund and used to be two sweaty dudes standing on the opposite side of him. One of those sweaty dudes had some girl draped all over him, rubbing his shoulders, and they were just basically screaming back and forth at each other. And brother was used probably 46 times in the two-minute promo that you got. And that was what you got. It's no longer this. It is it is fine arts of of work being done on television. And it is pretty cool to see, actually. It's a lot of fun to see the the advancement of WWE. Um, again, the last two episodes, Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown, you did get the ending credits. Again, showing that this is more of a television production, more of a television show, uh, which just kind of adds a little bit of credence to what you said there. Um, from Monday Night Raw and from Friday Night SmackDown, anything else that really stood out to you that that we didn't touch on? Oh my God, LA Knight, Andrade. It just sucked at the ending, you know, with LA Knight trying to botch the finish there where he jumps up. I think that move's got to be used maybe a little bit more cautiously. He doesn't got to use it every match because it just seems like if you're going to do that 200 times a year, it feels like 10, 15 times you're going to botch it. And he tried it twice. But that match in and of itself, outside of that, you know, it stuck out. And I love the the commentators. Well, the ropes were very wet, it appears. And they, they have to try to explain it. But I just thought their match and their chemistry was great. It's set up now backstage with... Um, it set up backstage with Carmelo Hayes and the shit talking that he did. I thought it was great. I thought SmackDown just had a nice edge to it all the way through. Um, I, I, you know, to me, the women's segment didn't capture me, but I could see where they're setting up kind of the Naomi Bailey uh, situation in terms of the loss that they suffered. Uh, Tiffany Stratton's always cool to see what's go- what's going on with her. Uh, <laughs> I, I like SmackDown. I just thought it had an edge and like an aggressive edge. And I just really, again, and I told my nephew, I said, look, when you see Jacob Fatu, whenever he shows up on the screen, he just looks massive. And I kind of, uh, the last note I took was, I kind of wanted Kevin Owens to nail Cody Rhodes in the head with the chair. And that's just probably me. Oh, being, that was something I wanted to talk about was, I, was yeah. Cody, Ro- I, I thought, Cody Rhodes, Kevin Owens. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you know, they teased it. They teased it. It had like the, the, the most believable part right at the end where he's got the chair, the hug. I just thought like it's coming. I thought they should just do it. Like, I think they're teasing it. I think it's great because... It sets up the ultimate betrayal, and it's good because, um, of course, I'm talking as a fan, I want my cake right now. I ain't trying to unwrap this thing over two fucking weeks, but in regards to what's best for business, when he does it, it's going to happen. When he does it, it's going to make the tying of their first match good, and then you have, you're have you basically building the layer of when Kevin Owens turns on Cody Rhodes, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be uh, more impactful for the crowd that sees it. It's going to be more impactful for Cody Rhodes, who has to act like this is the biggest betrayal of of another friend who turned on him. So it's setting up beautifully. And I just, uh, my notes were, oh my God, if we thought that storytelling was great six months ago, it's now on steroids. And when Triple H says, you, have, you ain't seen nothing yet, it literally is the WWE creative firing on all cylinders. And if they don't do it, the teases are fucking great because you sit on your edge of your seat and you're just like, do it, do it. Is he going to do it? Yeah, I thought maybe that they'd have an overrun right when he hugged him. And then, he, then he's got the, the way they shot it was pretty crazy. So to me, SmackDown just did a bunch of crazy shit to, to, to get you involved. And I just think that whatever they do next with Kevin Owens, if he signs his contract reportedly, <laughs> then yeah. I do think that potentially this is going to be a feud you know, that you can mix in maybe at the end of the year uh, or even Saturday night's main event if that's something you want to get to by December. Yeah, and, and look, this was uh, something that for some reason I did not make the note on it and I should have made the note on it, but um, I thought I would be able to spin it off of the Roman Cody talk and I totally forgot about it. I thought that was that part was really well done. And I think the, the, the big question I had coming out of it, like leaving Friday night, was is is – Kevin Owens going to play a role in this match with Roman Reigns and Cody versus the Bloodline 2.0. 
because I could see, again, you have to remember, he has beef with Roman. He has beef with Cody. I could see him costing them this match. I know, I know he's got beef with Bloodline 2.0, but I could see him costing both these guys this match. Um, and I was wondering if you maybe thought the same thing, or is this, like you said, something that just kind of gets pushed off until December, uh, where they maybe do it at Saturday night, or maybe this is something that they do a little bit later on at another pay-per-view. When do you anticipate them maybe pulling the plug on this? Because this was teased a little bit at uh, the that at Bash in Berlin. Kevin Owens obviously really kind of gave way to the friendship with Cody Rhodes there. And then we've had a couple of different segments and a couple of different times where it seems like Kevin Owens is wrestling with, do I turn on Cody or don't I? And this feels like the most heel version of, of that that we've gotten thus far. So is it going to be something that they let play out? Would you let it play out? Or would you maybe pull the plug a little bit sooner on it? Yeah, I think that there has to be some involvement at Survivor Series. I do think that potentially you could have Kevin Owens, Cody Rhodes, and uh, Roman Reigns in a match. Um, it, you know, and then two more, maybe the Usos, against the Bloodline. So you then have some dissent there. And then you I, I think the betrayal... You know, if you if you draw it out, because we're in early September, I don't know if you can draw it out to December, but you could do it at Saturday night's main event. Uh, you could do it there. You could do it at the, in, in October after Survivor Series, or uh, you could do it in October, but just a little bit before. You have a lot of options. So I, I do expect that there's going to be a Survivor Series uh, World uh, War Games with Kevin Owens involved with Cody Rhodes. So you're now looking at November. So you you got to kind of fill that next couple months. And that's going to be intriguing in terms of when. Maybe it might be sooner rather than later. So I'm curious: do they do it uh, at Survivor Series? Do they do it at Saturday Night's Main Event? Um, you got time with it, and I think they're waiting for the right time. But I don't know when the right time exactly is because you still mm-hmm. got to weave in the other storylines that Cody's involved in. And right now, it's Cody and Roman. And I do think that you know the timing could be the filler between um, you know Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. Once you pull the trigger in, in, in December, so or you could just say, you know, it's just going to really be, you know, I guess dependent upon when they start introducing what's next for Roman that you kind of can start to see what's next for Cody. So it'll be it'll, because clearly Roman's going to start feuding more, I think, with the bloodline and the Civil War. And so that leaves Cody once that's kind of buttoned up. Who's next? And I think it probably is going to be Kevin Owens. So we'll see how what, the timing of when they do it. Yeah, I think you're. I think the way you have this laid out, right? It's going to be Roman and the whole thing with the Civil War. I think that'll be his next chapter. At some point, he'll come back to Cody Rhodes, and in the meantime, Cody's going to have to have something to do, and that might be where him and Kevin Owens really mix it up again. So I think the way you have this laid out, and the way you're thinking about this, is is the right way, is the correct version of how this will go. So either way, all good stuff. I thought Monday Night Raw was fantastic. I thought Friday Night SmackDown was fantastic and had some really high spots. Um, uh, going back to, to what you said about Chelsea Green, I thought it was really funny. I thought it was it was done differently than the Roman Reigns and Cody version. I thought it was done to be a little bit more comedic. Remember, she herself, as good of a wrestler as she really is, and we don't really get to see that side of her all that much, she plays this very comedic, campy character. I think she does a fantastic job with what she did and the role she did. Messing around in a dumpster, thinking that there was <laughs> a uh, a raccoon in there. Uh, I thought it was. I thought it was all well done. Um, let's transition to AEW. I think the best thing on AEW Dynamite this week was all the John Moxley we got. Oh yeah, I thought John Moxley was absolutely incredible, and I thought he was completely over the top. Uh, in my notes here, I said John Moxley seems to be controlled violence. Uh, he is just so all over the place and just so angry, but seems to be in such control of, of where he's directing his anger, his violence, taking different people out. Uh, there was a scene where he had a hammer. They did the whole hammer to the hand, uh, gimmick, uh, where it was, um, one of the guys from, from top flight, uh, they were a little bit upset about being, jumped last week on dynamite and uh mark quinn mark quinn ended up getting his hand smashed by uh by john moxley uh with the hammer uh as he was being held down by claudio castagnoli and marina shafir 
my whole thing with all of this, with the John Moxley and the Darby Allen thing, the, the, the direction that we're going right now, my concern, because I love what we're seeing from John Moxley. I love what we're doing with John Moxley. I think this is incredible work that we're getting from him. I think the group, I think Claudio and Pac look the strongest that they have ever looked in this group. Marina Shafir, this is the best she's ever looked. She looks like a legitimate threat which is something you couldn't say before when she was wrestling. I didn't really take her serious. She looks like a legitimate threat, and she looks to be the right-hand man, woman, for John Moxley. There was a point in, in all of this madness that was going on with Top Flight and Commander where she ends up putting her hand up and holds Claudio back and says, just stop, let him handle his business, basically. And she seems to be... On such another level, and that is just getting that rub off of John Moxley, and, and to me, that's that's incredible. I think that's great. And like I said, I'm loving what we're seeing from John, and I'm loving what we're seeing from this group that is associated with John Moxley, and this new version of the BB, BCC. I think it's great. But my concern is AEW is booking themselves into a bit of a corner here with Darby Allen and John Moxley. And let me explain, and I want to get your take on this. John Moxley right now. I think he's firing on all cylinders. I think on a scale of 1 to 10, this guy's at about a 14 right now. And I think, like I said, Marina Shafir looks so good. Uh, Claudio and Pac look so good. They've got this thing going on with Wheeler Yuta, so it's a way to work Wheeler Yuta in. And Wheeler Yuta has been playing his role so incredibly well. Wheeler Yuta basically was a shoebox for months. He was just a guy who had a belt, and he was just kind of there. You didn't really think of Wheeler Yuta at all. Now he's an integral part of this storyline. John Moxley will be taking on Darby Allin. Uh, next week, and Darby Allen is supposed to be getting this monster push, and Darby Allen is supposed to be at some point challenging Brian Danielson, and they're supposed to be doing all this stuff with Darby Allen. Darby Allen just came back. Darby Allen was on the shelf for a little bit after getting hit by a bus and and breaking a foot, and not being able to go climb a mountain. Um, Darby Allen has been used sporadically since coming back. Darby Allen's one of your bigger baby faces, one of your, your guys who is incredibly over john moxley just took up this psychotic controlled violence role we're going to put these two guys in a match and the winner is going to get to take on brian danielson at some point down the road i don't know what we're going to do but some point they get to take him on i don't know how you have both these guys coming out still being strong if john moxley loses i feel like that derails a lot of what he's been attempting to do if john moxley loses I feel like that kind of undermines everything that he has built over the course of the last couple of weeks. And it's, that's crazy to say. It's only really been about two weeks, and he has helped establish this version of him, this version of the B BBC, this version of, of this controlled, violent nature for this group. And I think it is fantastic. I think it has roots over the course of what he's done over the last two weeks. If he loses to Darby Allen, I feel like you undermined that work that's been put in and how much he has helped us grow in that limited time. And then if you do this to Darby Allen, I feel like you're setting him back again. This is a guy who has been used a little bit sparingly. And most of his stuff has been this, this stuff with Jack Perry and it's been some of the stuff with the elite. And it really hasn't seemed like he's had a legit story to go on. It doesn't seem like he's had a legit thing that he's been working towards it just kind of feels like he's been kind of put into these matches and he's just kind of here here's some stuff and he's kind of taken for lack of a better term he's taken chicken shit and turned it into chicken salad to me putting these guys together and having them meet so soon really feels like you're going to end up losing one way or another it, it doesn't seem like you can come out a winner on both sides and i feel like that is a bad that's a bad booking i feel like when you do this you need to have both these guys come out better for it yeah no look i just think you keep pushing john moxley to the moon i just think that he's a star you, you just like you said controlled violence look darby allen his work with sting i think put him on the map so i like the opportunity that he's got and, and with the respect that he's earned i just think that you're now seeing a little bit more story with him because look man his wrestling style can be very dangerous and you just kind of worry that the longevity of how long he's going to do those high spots and those crazy off the ladder moves and casket matches and weird ass shit. Um, I don't think that guys like that right now 
are the ones that are needing the most momentum. I think that you want to continue to push guys like Adam Page, uh, guys like Swerve Strickland, uh, you know, MJF, Daniel Garcia. Those are the kind of guys that can draw money. And unfortunately, right now, AEW is getting pinched. They're getting raided. So you got to uh, make sure that the stars that are going to be working with the Brian Danielsons and the Moxley continue to look good in the wrestling matches. Wins and losses, you know, over time, yeah, in AEW, they've made that an emphasis. But I just think that John Mox, I think that you just continue to highlight what John Moxley has been doing. And I think the story is coming, a bigger version of, of whatever story they're going to tell in terms of this is not your company. I thought that really the promo that he did with Shivani a couple weeks ago was really underrated. I thought that it set the tone of what we're seeing, which is, hey, this is different. This is, you know, maybe more than wrestling. This is violence. This is chaos. And this is, and I get it, you know, with John Moxley, that's kind of how he's always wanted to be viewed as a, as a monster, as a threat physically, as a violent individual. So I can't wait to see where it goes. And it's just, a, it's just one of those things where, when you have a guy like Moxley, it's hard to turn away from what he's doing. And I think they're giving him some good creative. Now, the thing with AEW is you got to give that level of effort to a, a couple more people. And that's where it kind of looks like it's lacking is that there's stuff there, but it just it feels like, okay, Moxley gets an hour and a half of the meeting and the rest of the show gets a half hour. And you're just like, you can kind of tell. But I do think that AEW, in my opinion, is starting to turn the corner a little bit on, okay, if we're going to tell stories, let's tell one really great one, but WWE is telling like six really great ones, and they're doing it at like a, another level. So that's where there's a difference is that unfortunately there's two companies doing it, and one is doing it at an A++++ level, and another one's kind of getting there, but they're not doing it on a consistent basis. But you got to give credit when they do do it with John Moxley and the story that they're telling with Claudio and Pac and uh, the way they're they're positioning these guys. Man, it's 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 nice television. Yeah, it is really good television. Uh, the the other thing that really stood out to me with Dynamite this week was the fact that we might be rekindling the United Empire with uh, Will Osprey and Kyle Fletcher. Uh, Will Osprey, Kyle Fletcher, and Takeshita took on the Elite and Okada. Uh, this was a, a triple threat match. Will Ospreay ends up hitting, uh, I believe it was a hidden blade for Kyle Fletcher to roll that into a pin, and the guys get the win. And the big thing, I think, coming out of this match, besides this match being awesome, and Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher really, you can tell that these guys really do enjoy working together, and these guys really are friends, but they seemed incredibly happy exuberant about the victory while Takeshita was a little bit upset. And there were points in this match where Takeshita and Osprey kind of went a little bit back and forth at the end. Osprey standing across from Takeshita and he goes to shake hands and Takeshita basically pushes him in the chest. And there's this mounting tension between these two, which has me incredibly interested because we've talked about this before. Osprey is to the moon. The guy is great, right? Takeshita is a guy who we feel like has a ton of potential Hasn't quite met it yet. And remember, Kyle Fletcher and Takeshita are part of this Don Callis family. Osprey left this. So there's probably some hurt feelings there. But it seems like Osprey wants to reunite with Fletcher and reestablish uh, the, the uh, United Empire. So there's, there's some layers here. And I think – we, we, we really do bash on AEW for not doing a great job of storytelling. I think this is some subtle storytelling with this specific program that we're working with Osprey, Takeshita, and Kyle Fletcher and Don Callis. And I think this is incredibly interesting. I feel like overall Dynamite had a lot of really great matches, but I don't really feel like we moved a lot of storylines along. I feel like this specifically has layered stories in it. I want to see where this goes. I also want to see Will Ospreay and Takeshita bring the house down with a match because I feel like these guys could really rip it up, and I feel like it could be a lot of fun. What are your thoughts on on the subtle storytelling? I don't know if you picked it up. If you did, let me know. If you didn't, tell me you didn't. I, it doesn't matter. It's just This is what I'm seeing. And, and I want to know what you feel about Ospreay to, to, to Takeshita. Yeah, I, just, I would love to see it. I think it's money. You print money, and you, look – that look at what we said a couple weeks ago. Takeshka is somebody that people would gravitate towards and want to see an active feud. So this is good. 
I do think that you just got to be careful. A lot of people are saying, look, it maybe Will Ospreay and Ricochet could get in the ring very soon. You need a program with that. You need to make sure you don't just throw it on a show and say, hey, here we have a match. You know, so you just want to make sure that these are, are set up programs. And absolutely, I think that with Will Ospreay, he's just got the star power. So he can, whatever he's involved in, people are going to pay attention to. And so you just got to make sure you don't drop the ball on the creative side. And Will Ospreay, man, has just been a great investment. He's just like, okay, you know, when you go to watch Dynamite, you just ask yourself, okay, what's what's going on with MJF? Unfortunately, he's going to be gone filming a movie, it looks like. And now you have other stars that need to carry it. And that's going to be Will Ospreay, Takeshka, John Moxley, the, the champs. So to me, you just highlight Will Ospreay, let him cook and do his thing. And man, what an investment. And then it's just unfortunate. My other note was the women just, whatever, for whatever reason, I'm not gravitated toward nothing with yeah. the women on AEW. Yep. I don't understand. You have star power. You have, I don't know if you just need a little bit more hype. You need a little, you just need a little bit more, basically 20% more of everything. Better in-ring storytelling, better creative, better matches, just more. It just seems like, man, the women are kind of fading pretty quickly in AEW right now. Dude, there was a match on Dynamite, yes. and it had four women in it, and I could care less about all four women in that match. I, look, Mariah May, as attractive as she is and as decent of a role as she's playing with her current character, I just don't care about her. Serena Deep, Serena Deep has a, has, Serena Deep can do all the things in the wrestling ring. She is fantastic in the wrestling ring. She has a problem connecting with the audience. That's her big flaw. That's the big thing that that's the big downfall with her, right? She could legitimately be on the same level as, say, a Britt Baker, a Soraya when she was in her prime, Sasha Banks when Sasha Banks was in WWE, uh, as good as as Becky Lynch. Her big flaw, she can't connect with the people in the stands. She can't make you care about her matches. You just don't. As good as she is in the wrestling ring. She cannot do a good enough job with a promo, and she cannot do a good enough job making you care about whatever journey she is on. And then the other two women, the one you haven't seen in freaking forever, and I totally forgot she was even in uh, AEW. And then the other one is basically on, on Collision or Rampage. There were four women in this match where you could have, where Team Meteor could have won the match, and I probably would have been more excited about Team Meteor winning the match than than any one of these four women. I do not care about what is going on with the women's division in AEW right now, and that is sad because you've got Jamie Hader back, Britt Baker. Whenever she's around and she's not doing whatever that's getting her in trouble lately, uh, you have. Soraya, which has been a bit of a flop since she's been in AEW, I don't know. I, I don't know what they expected or what or how they wanted to to do that, but it just really hasn't worked. Uh, Tony Storm, I know Tony Storm's out right now, taking a little bit of time. Uh, Mariah May was supposed to be a steal, and I feel like they've kind of botched some of that. Uh, you're paying um, Mercedes Monet a shit ton of money, and I much rather watch a shoebox wrestle than watch her. Uh, you've got Willow Nightingale, who I think is fantastic, and you've done a whole lot of nothing with her. Chris Statlander has a ton of potential. You've done nothing with her. So you have wrestlers. You have women. Sheeta is probably my my most favorite and over wrestler in AEW right now, and you've done a whole lot of nothing with Sheeta. Like, let that tell you about your women's division. It is It is completely sad. I just went through and I named nine wrestlers off the top of my head. You've done nothing with really any of them. It's really unfortunate. Uh, the women's division in AEW is pretty sad right now. Uh, was there anything else that really stuck out to you from AEW? No, all good, man. I just think that moving forward, I'm curious to see what Grand Slam is going to look like. I'm curious mm -hmm. how everything's going to shake out. And the news really now, uh, my note other than the show was the stuff that happened away from television was more impactful this week than the stuff in the ring. And uh, it happens that way. Sometimes news gets going. People are interested in a lot of things behind the scenes with AEW. And I just think that when you release the news, there was, there was a lot of good reaction to it. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see now what the future holds for AEW because they've settled into their niche. And my note, basically, basically to summarize, they've settled into their niche. And I just think you and I want them to kind of get out of the mud a little bit into that niche and kind of compete more 
to draw more ratings, to just do a little bit more. It's like, okay, we made 50K this week and we're gonna make 50K next week and we're gonna make 50K. It's like, come on, do a little bit more to close the gap between you and WWE because that's really the thing is that you have your own show, but you gotta continue to draw eyeballs to your show. And unfortunately, the only way you've been doing it is by signing other people and, and stuff like that. Some news yep. was made this week, but I just think that AEW is not doing enough to close the gap and to draw steadily more audience. I just think that what's been highlighted is um, 30% audience decrease from 24 now from from what they were doing last year. And that's a lot. That's a lot of people not staying with your product. So you got to change it. Yep. I, I agree with you 110%. Uh, what was your show of the week this week? A lot, a lot of good stuff to choose from here. Yeah, no doubt. Even CM Punk showing up at NXT, I thought that was special. I thought the the NXT has been doing great. Um, I want to give the show of the week. I thought to uh, SmackDown. I just thought that uh, the six man tag was was great. The storytelling and when you have an eight minute vignette that's produced, but like a movie, SmackDown was a show of the week. Yeah, look, I thought SmackDown was great, and the more we talked about it, the more and more I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought Raw was really, really good. So I'm going to give my share to, to Raw, and I'll put your share down for SmackDown. Um, uh, but look, either way you go, I think WWE put on really, really good products this week. Uh, you want some news notes and some rumors? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? It's like a book, cuz. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so you kind of teased it a little bit uh, regarding Kevin Owens earlier. I did, did not put this in the news and notes, but... Uh, there is supposedly a contract extension out there for Kevin Owens. He has not signed it. AEW is incredibly interested in signing Kevin Owens and getting him to AEW. You must remember, Kevin Owens is really, really good friends with the elites. Uh, this goes back to their time in ROH and some of the stuff that they've done over in New Japan. Um, they have worked together and they have done things in, in the past that have really helped set each other up for success. So they have a really good friendship. They are legit buddies, like talk to each other every day on the phone. So there is uh, a concerted effort by AEW to try to get Kevin Owens over there. And Kevin Owens has a bit of a decision to make for himself. Now, speaking of decisions that were made, it's split spill for this wrestling power couple. Multiple people in the wrestling world started speaking about this dynamic wrestling duo calling it quits this past weekend. Uh, according to many talking heads in the wrestling world, Adam Cole and Britt Baker are done. The reason for the breakup was not given, but what was said was that Cole is moving back to Pennsylvania and Baker is staying in Florida. So we'll stay tuned and we'll see if we can uncover what actually took place here. But sounds like Britt Baker's real life and stuff backstage in wrestling has just been a little bit messy lately. Don't know what's going on with her. So uh, stay tuned. We'll do some uncovering and we'll see if we can get a, a follow up to this story. A power couple that is not splitting up, AEW and Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, AEW and Warner Brothers Discovery are close to finalizing a four-year deal, according to a recent report on the ongoing media rights negotiation. Dave Meltzer said that the deal is a done deal, he said on Wrestling Observer Radio, noting that there will be changes. John Orand provided further insight via his Puck newsletter reporting Insiders are telling me that a formal announcement could come as soon as next week, barring any last-minute changes. It looks like it will be a four-year deal, three years guaranteed, plus an optional year, and $170 million per year number floating around. Wrestling message boards is apparently in the ballpark. Orand would go on to explain that the strategy behind Warner Brothers Discovery's David Zaslov's approach, noting... According to the parameters of the agreement, AEW matches will air on TNT, TBS, and True TV twice a week, further evidencing Zaz's strategy of making the latter two networks more valuable and sports orientated in their cable bundle as potency of the TNT decline sans professional basketball rights. Remember, TNT uh, is supposed to be losing their, their basketball rights. Uh, the success of the report deal, success of the reported deal has stopped Tony Khan's plans to expand AEW. However, Orrand also noting AEW is pitching another package, primarily to broadcast channels. There's no timetables for when AEW will push, will start to push that deal. Now, there was a, another report that kind of backs this up, and that was that AEW filed for uh, a new trademark for a program called Shockwave, 
and that there was a rumor that AEW and Fox could be working something out. The thought was that Fox would take AEW and would air it on FS1. Uh, probably would be an hour-long show. Don't know what it would consist of, but there was the thought of another AEW program uh, that Fox would end up getting to fill some time slots, primarily on FS1. I don't believe it would be on your regular Fox channel. Now, WWE is bringing back a retro program. WWE has announced, officially announced the return of Saturday night's main event for this December in Long Island, New York. A report by WrestleVote stated that WWE was looking to bring back Saturday night's main event in December as a televised special on NBC. We now know that it's going to be December 14th. Uh, right here, Variety officially confirms that the event would return, taking place on December 14th in the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Long Island, New York. Per Variety, WWE's iconic series Saturday Night Main Event has set its return premiere date at NBC. Variety has learned that the pro wrestling series will air live on NBC and simulcast on Peacock on December 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. It will originate from the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum on Long Island, New York, the site of the first ever Saturday Night Main Event back in 1985. This will be the first of four quarterly WWE primetime specials for NBC, which were first revealed when WWE signed a new five-year rights deal with NBC Universal that saw WWE's weekly SmackDown series move back to the USA Network. SmackDown has been airing on Fox since 2019, but made its USA Network return on September 13th. Peacock also continues to be the live stream home of WWE's premium live events in the U.S., including upcoming events like Bad Blood and Crown Jewel. Saturday night's main event originally aired in late night time slot on NBC on weeks when Saturday Night Live did not have new episodes. It aired nearly 30 episodes on broadcast network TV between 1985 and 1991. The show then aired two more episodes on Fox in 1992. It was previously revealed that NBC previously revived at NBC for five more episodes between 2006 and 2008. And I went to one of those that took place here in Michigan. I think it was at Cobo Hall. It was a good time. Um, sticking with uh smackdown let me scroll through these notes real quick we've got so much going on uh smackdown it is being talked about that smackdown will right here uh on thursday russell votes dropped a huge note about smackdown uh the word was smackdown was going to be going to a three-hour long program uh they have followed up and added to their initial report saying that this will reportedly take effect for six months from January 3rd until sometime in June next year, with SmackDown moving back to two hours after this point. Something else we wanted to touch on quickly when we mentioned that SmackDown will be moving to three hours as of right now. The chatter internally is that it's only for six months. Three hours is going to start in January when Raw moves to three hours. The plan right now is that six months down the road, SmackDown will go back to two hours. Now, me, myself, I believe this is a trial run for something in the future. We'll have to stand by and stay tuned to see what comes. But there's going to be a stretch where we'll be taking in at least six hours of WWE a week for Monday Night Raw and for SmackDown. SmackDown potentially going to three hours. I believe this will be taking place someplace in the future. This is just a test to see what ratings do and how it pans out and what the crowd's reaction is. Now, this AEW star wants out. Former TNT champion Miro, who has been absent from AEW television for all of 2024 so far, has requested his release from the company. The last time Miro was in action was the World's End pay-per-view on December 30th, where he picked up a win over Andrade El Idolo. Since then, he's been spending time in Bulgaria and hasn't appeared for AEW. Fightful Select reported that Miro has requested his release. The report notes that Miro was sidelined for longer than expected after the Andrade match, but he has been healthy for quite some time. It is said that he and the company haven't been able to get on the same page creatively, and this was a common occurrence throughout the past couple of years. There was said to be consideration of including him in the all-in London Casino Gauntlet match, and he pitched working with John Moxley earlier in the year. He is earning into the seven figures on his current contract and is said to have signed a four-year contract extension around spring of 2022. So he's under contract till around spring of 2026. It's unknown at this point if the release has been or will be granted, nor it's known whether or not WWE has interest in Rusev. 
A few guys who are definitely out, well, at least reported to be gone. That's the Lucha Brothers. Uh, There was a report earlier this week that the tag team has signed with WWE and will be heading to the main roster very soon. So you're going to want to keep your eyes peeled for the Lucha Brothers showing up in WWE. And finally, Kenny Omega. He is still on the shelf. Kenny has been out of action since December of 2023 in AEW following a potential life-threatening diverticulitis diagnosis. Recently, it was reported that Omega had returned to training with moderate intensity as he prepares to get back on the AEW screens. It was noted in the report, however, that he won't be back anytime soon in a wrestling capacity due to weakness in the abdominal region. The weakness stems from the surgery that he had when he that he had when there being with there being no estimated uh, time on a return. Omega has provided an update on his current medical status. While commenting on Samoa Joe's role in the upcoming Like a Dragon video game, tweeting, Joe's going to kill you, but hopefully not me. I'm not medically cleared. While Omega hasn't been able to compete, he did make a return on May 1st, 2024's episode of AEW Dynamite and was laid out by the Elite. Since all of that, he has been on the shelf and really hasn't been seen anywhere. That's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've agreed or disagreed with anything that we've said, if you felt like the promo wasn't cinema, let us know. Hit us up at Detroit Podcast. Always love the wrestling references. And because I think it's getting closer and closer, I think we are now one week away from the debut of the Vince doc. I just think that everybody's crazy about it to see what it looks like. I think it's coming out Wednesday the 25th. Um, I do think people think that – Early on, the perception is that it's going to be a hit piece on Vince McMahon. I'm just curious to see the angles that it takes. Who talks? What do they talk about? And especially in light of what's going on with Diddy, it's just crazy the way in which the world has spun in regards to the, deb- the debauchery of high-powered, ego, egotistical men. And it's just crazy, the allegations that have been kind of surfacing and, and what we've talked about and, and the way in which... Current performers have to kind of wrestle with that, especially those like like John Cena, who's going to be heavily involved in wrestling in 2025. I'm curious to see how many questions he takes after the the dot comes out. So, well, I probably will binge watch it from Wednesday to Friday. We'll see uh, if it's a weekly thing that that comes. I hope it's done that way. I hope it's not just like eight episodes that just drop because I'm like shit. I got a lot to do and and dropping six seven hours. Right in the middle of the week with the NFL going on, it would be crazy. But I'm curious to see how it all plays out. A lot of good news and notes this week, the world of professional wrestling. And if you're into beefs, J.D. from New York and Sean Ross Sapp had a beef. They bitched each other out. They aired out all their dirty laundry allegations, shit that's been said. And I guess they called each other and hashed it out. So it's interesting that the world of wrestling even has beef away from the ring For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I'm the doc, John Macaroon. I can't wait for next week to fire it up for another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.